I have him transferred from Fuller Seminary, right? So yes, that's sir. good. Yes, sir. His wife, Oshiri, is here. Will you wave your hands over there, please? You, you, you've been married how long? Oh, I better get this right, huh? You better get that right. That's uh, right. 22 years. 22 years. And you have seven children. Seven. Seven. Do you know all their names? <laughs> <laughs> and you know their, their <laughs> birthdays. Yeah, yeah. You know that. <laughs> Seven children, and you like sports. Yes, sir. Yeah, baseball is your favorite. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, sir. what's your favorite team? Uh, Dodgers. No, I'll forget you. Dodgers. You're, you're in angel territory. We'll let you. Go. You, 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 you made it to the World Series. <laughs> what can I say? And but you got a scholarship um, to play basketball That's at right. Florida A and M. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. How about that? Yes, sir. And uh, then and you're a, a Star Wars. Man. Absolutely. I understand you've read 70 plus books. Uh, yeah, at least. Star Wars. At I least. didn't know there were 70 Star Wars. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. There, there, there are. Isn't yeah. that amazing? So this guy is a well-rounded person <laughs> who is uh, going to preach for us today on hope through diversity. And it's my privilege to introduce this man, this brother in Christ, uh, Rudy Haygood, who is the senior pastor of University Christian Church in Los Angeles, and we're honored to have you with us, brother, Thanks and so. look forward to how God is going to speak to us Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I was told I have uh, 20 to 25 minutes. Is that still true? What time should I be done? Somebody throw that out at me. What time should I be done? 10 20. All right. All right. All right. So I heard somebody say 11.20. All right. <laughs> um, is that me? Am, am I the problem? I hear all that static. All right, I got, they're, they're running down to help me save me. Is it my shirt? All right. All right, here we go. Oh, OK, it's, it's not my antenna. Is that better? Are you the man? All right, so uh, let's jump right on in. Let's jump right on in. We're, we're talking about hope for diversity. And uh, it's uh, unity is a topic uh, that is uh, dear to me. It uh, is profound to me and uh, not, for, uh, not just for the obvious reasons that I am an African-American uh, in an American context and all the history uh, that goes along with that, but uh, unity matters so much to me because it mattered so much to my Lord, to my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I, I just want to be uh, authentic and real uh, about a topic like this. Uh, my generation, my mother's generation, and my mother's mother's generation dealt with Racism in a combative and confrontive way, and, and in a lot of ways, uh, I, I'm excited to be talking to this generation, to millennials, because millennials, whether Christian or non, we may need you to lead the way. Uh, a, a, a brother of mine uh, that I grew up with, he uh, he was talking about his kids, and and and, and he was saying that how. Your generation has an opportunity to see race in a unique way and that, that you, you guys don't necessarily see race the way the generations prior saw it until the current political climate, right? And if we are going to be one, you guys, Christian and non, may need to lead the way. So I hope I have your ear. Uh, the, the truth is this, that... Christianity and Christians should be, and if you're a non-Christian, I want you to hear this, Christians should be at the forefront of leading unity and calling all people to be one because Christians say that we stand on the gospel of Jesus Christ, that our foundation is the gospel. And Ephesians 3, 6 says this, that the mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, in that day, they divided up all people into two groups, 
Jews and Gentiles. And the mystery of the gospel was that this gospel is for everyone. Christians, we cannot be the dividing line in the culture today. Our, our, our convictions and our politics cannot cause us to be the ones that draw lines that separate us from being one people. It's anti-Jesus. It's not Jesus. As Christians in this environment, we must be at the forefront of the fight for unity. For all people, yes, we must hold to theological truths. Yes, we must hold to our convictions. But unity, the unity of the spirit, is a theological doctrine as well. And if I hold to that doctrine, I must hold with equal fierceness to the doctrine of the unity of the spirit. Which means that unity belongs to the Holy Spirit. So for me to steal unity, I never had the right to take it in the first place. Unity wasn't mine. It was God's. I'm going to start preaching in a second. Right now I'm just talking. <laughs> we have to be the bridge. Church folks, we have to be the bridge. I hope I get to my text. Right now I'm just sharing. Look, I I used to do social work, and I and I, I I used to be out with families who are in dysfunction and who are struggling every day to make it. And and, and I remember sitting there with all these non-Christians serving these families, and and the non-Christians that I'm out there helping people with would look at me and say, "Oh, you're a Christian." First, they would be surprised that I was there. Because they, they, their view of Christians is, oh, you guys are the folks who vote against helping people, but don't get out here and actually help people. And you know what I said? All I could say was, I'm here. That's all I could say. Oh, yeah, we go on five-day and ten-day ten day mission trips. Oh, yeah, we'll feed the homeless once a week if we're really doing something, really just once a year. But we vote in ways that don't allow people to get help, but then we're not out sacrificing our life to help them. Oh, you ain't got to clap. This, this, I'm talking about Christianity. I am not telling you how to vote. I'm talking about being a bridge. You can vote how you want to vote. Make sure you're being Bridge, listen. A bridge is something that helps people get from A to B. A bridge is that which jumps into the chasm and, and makes sure that this land is not separated from that land. A bridge, in order to be a bridge, must get walked on are driven on. Because a bridge that doesn't get walked on, a bridge that doesn't get taken advantage of, a bridge that doesn't get muddied up is no longer a bridge, it's just art. And Christians, sometimes we have just become art. When God has called us to be the bridge, we are the ones to bring people together. A priest is one who connects the hand of God and those who don't know God and stands in the gap until the two can be one. And then they go and grab the hand of God again and grab someone else who doesn't know God until they can know God. And that's who we are. I'm going to preach in a second. Don't worry. I'm going to preach until we get there. Today, millennials, non-Christian, and especially Christian, I'm going to charge you today, do the unthinkable, get walked on, get walked on, be a bridge, be the solution.
Can y'all tell I'm not mine? Something is burning inside of me. This is ooh. Our text today is John 1, 1 through 14. If you have a Bible, I would love for you to turn there, turn your Bible there. If you have a, a, a Bible app, please turn the app to John 1. Uh, we're going to be in 1 through 14. I'm going to read the text if you don't have it. But John 1, 1 through 14, that's where we're going to be. And, and, and we're there in John 1, 1 through 14, really to look at two uh, uh, premier characters. The number one character in the Word of God, Jesus Christ, uh, and, and one of the, the top five for sure, John the Baptist. And, and we're going to look at them because John the Baptist was a bridge. John the Baptist bridged us to Jesus. That, that Jesus was a bridge who, who bridged us to God. And now we have a pathway to the Lord. And because they are a bridge, we have access to God. And my call to you today is to be like Jesus. Be a bridge. Get walked on. Connect A to B. Connect people to God. And connect people to one another. The primary goal of a bridge is getting walked over. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The, the other Gospels, they start with genealogies that express the Jewishness of the Gospel or expresses the humanity of the Gospel. And it, and, and it sets up or sets a context based on a, 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 maybe a religious reality or, or a human reality. But, but John sets up the context of this Gospel by setting a theological tone that Jesus the, the word that Jesus is the word and the word was God and he was with God and that everything is based on Jesus Christ that he is who we look at he is who we emulate and he is the light and I'm just going to make one simple point here because of my time and the point is this light shines we, we, we look at light and, 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 and something we turn on and turn off no 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 light shines it's just what it does. We don't do something. We are something. We don't turn on or off. We either are reflective of Christ or we are not. I don't get to decide when I'm going to be a bridge for people. I either am a bridge or I'm not a bridge. I'm either for the mystery of the gospel, I'm either for all people, or I'm not for all people. Y'all can be quiet all y'all want to. I'm going to preach anyway. All right, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. See, as Christians, Jesus is the light, and those who follow him are reflective of that light. We're not the light, but we shine because we reflect the one who is our Savior. His light is in front of us. We are in his presence, and his presence comes and dwells on us, and that presence reflects into the world. So automatically, those who are in Christ reflect the light of Christ. They don't turn it on or off. They just reflect it because they are reflective of the light. I'm making a point. You'll get it in a minute. It says that John 
bore witness to the light. A witness is someone who's seen it, someone who's lived for it, and one who's died for it. See, this word witness, this word in the Greek, which, which we get our word martyr from, it, 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 it has this idea, yes, that you've seen something. So if you are a witness, you are someone who's spent time with Christ. You've seen him. You've been in his presence. You, you reflect him. You are a witness. Can I get a witness? Oh, y'all ain't never been to church before, huh? <laughs> At least they've never been to black church, huh? And then they have been, can I get a witness? Yeah. All right, all right. You, you, you can talk. You can talk in church. You, you can talk. All right, all right. A witness is one who's seen it. But in order to be a witness, you also have to live it. You, you can't talk about what you've seen if you're not living what you're talking about. Oh, it's going to make sense in a minute, right? And if you're a witness, not only have you seen it and you live it, but you must die to yourself because all that matters to you is because you've seen something greater than yourself is to reflect that light and not your own interest. We must be martyrs. We must die to ourselves. If, if we are to be witness, if we are to bear witness of this light, we have to have seen the light. If, if we are to bear witness of the light, we must die to ourselves or we will reflect ourselves. Point is simple. In order to bear witness, you've got to be a witness. Oh, I'm, I'm coming at you, Christians. And if you're a non-Christian, I hope you're listening and you're looking at them. I'll be looking at these Christians and saying, I heard that preacher say, if you are Christian, you have spent time with Jesus, you live for Jesus, and you reflect Jesus, and I want to hold you to that. Because if you want me to be that, I need to see you living it. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Grana, I need 40 minutes because I'm running past this text too fast. I need 40 minutes. All right. Verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So we just talked about John the Baptist, and he, he bore witness so that he might be a witness. And now we're talking about the Christ, the true light, which gives light to everyone. He was coming into the world, and he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word, which is Jesus, this Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father full of grace and truth. This word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus who was in heaven, who made all things, who created all things, this word, this logos, this divine intelligence, this when God speaks, so Jesus, this creative agent, Jesus, he, he left heaven and he came and dwelt with us. He came and lived with us. He, he, the, the word here is he tabernacled, or in, in, in plain language, he, he came down to, to, to the earth and he set up a tent and made this his home. He, he, he came and lived with us. Why? So he could reach us. The one we claim to be like left Bel Air and moved to Watts. He didn't go to Watts and say, hey, I got something better for y'all. Come over here to Bel Air with me. Me and the Fresh Prince are having a great time. No, he said, no, I want to reach you. I'm going to set up my tent so that y'all can tell I'm never going 
camping because I don't make no tent. <laughs> Me and my wife go camping all the time at the Marriott. <laughs> he came and set up tent. He came and dwelt with and lived with. Why? Because he wanted to reach them. Jesus was a bridge. See, and in order for it to, to get those people over here, he had to go and set up a tent. He didn't build the bridge starting at Bel Air. He built the bridge starting at once so that people might be able to follow him and go from where they lived to where he lived. He dwelt with them and understood them and actually became them. We're going to be bridges. We have to be in people's life to the degree that they see us as them. Nothing's wrong with living in your nice suburban home and having your beautiful church, but that ain't Christian. Christian is going to the people you want to reach, becoming like them, living with them to the point that they know you and trust you, that now that they can follow you because you are them and you understand them. Oh, it's going to make sense in a minute. My point is simple. Become them by dwelling with them. All right. Let me try to drive this home. I got like five minutes. I got to be fast. All right. Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect, one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus came, lived with us to the point where he understood what we're going through so that as we go through the difficulties of trying to live a holy life, he understands us. He's sympathetic with our plight. Even though he never sinned, he understands the impact of living in this flesh. And what is the result? Because he knows how hard it is, he gives us grace upon grace upon grace. And he said, they can't do it. I'm going to do it for them. I'm going to die so that they don't have to die. I'm going to live and show them how to live this life so they can have a model of what this, I understand what it's like. Oh, that's still blank faced. Right. I'm not telling you which way to vote. Dr. Brown. I'm not telling any way, anybody which way to vote. Sound boot. I'm not telling people how to vote. Or which way to vote. I guess I am kind of telling you how to vote. Okay, if you are a poor person, and you don't understand what it's like when a law takes thousands of dollars from you, hundreds of thousands of dollars from you, millions of dollars for you, for you, maybe before you vote, you should go and get some friends who have that kind of money, understand what that's like, so even if you vote against their interests, you mourn and weep with them. Not a false cry. You know as Christians go, yeah, I care about those people, but this is the righteousness of the Lord. <laughs> no, 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 no. If you are going to vote against these dreamers, if you, if you are hardcore, this is right. We are a sovereign state. You need to know enough dreamers and be able to look that person in the eye, see them, them, them face to face, live with them, tabernacle with them, so that when they get shipped out of the only country they know, you weep and mourn the same way their mother weeps and mourns. Or you have no right to go against their interests. Why? Because that's not Christian. If, if, if we are going to say we are bridges, we have to be like the one we say we follow. And what did he do? He tabernacled with us. He became one of us so that he sympathizes with us. And what does that sympathy create? 
grace upon grace upon grace. I understand your plight. I'll make a way. I'll die for you. And if, if, if you are willing to vote against someone's interest, you should be willing to do something to help them in that situation. And I don't care if you're a poor person voting against the interests of rich, if you're a rich person voting against, against the interests of poor, as Christians, we care about everyone because we are the bridge. Yeah. What's wrong with, 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 with the racial tensions? We, we do it pompously. We, we do it as humans, as American citizens. But Christians, we have to be the bridge. We have to be the ones who are willing to be witnesses to see Jesus, to live for Jesus, and then die for Jesus, to die for our own self-interest. Oh, look. My wife was actually have said this. I don't care if you don't ask me to come back. i got to tell you the truth. We have to be the bridge. A lot of people I respect are probably going to talk to me after this. <laughs> Paul said it this way. To the weak, I became weak. That I might win the weak. I become all things to all people. That by all means, I might have some. I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessing. See, the gospel, this mystery that is for everyone, I'll do anything so that people can share and participate in the gospel, not protect my own interests. I want to share something about being a bridge. It's called Bridge Builders. My brother wrote it. I'm going to read it. And the message will be yours. It says this. Bridge builders are concerned with building. Building to perfection. Building with purpose. Building with precision. They build bridges to get to the other side. They are destination obsessed. So they build. They are so gap averse that the very existence, existence of nothingness that separates the place here from the place there is anathema to their souls. They become consumed with bringing together heretofore divided places and peoples and opportunities. They are peddlers of hope, of a hope that cannot be realized without a coming together of two sides, of a hope that transcends the nothingness of the demonic chasm which separates side from side and person from person and nation from nation and race from race and man from woman and clappers from meditators and blue collars from white collars and democrats from republicans and liberals from conservatives and progressives from traditionalists and even Starbucks from coffee beans. Of a hope that says whatever stands between, between us is only real because of the myths we believe in order to assuage our impoverished prejudices, because of the lies we romance and massage, because of our uncomfortableness with the fact that our presuppositions are only a lie, because we are more comfortable believing we are better off divided than we are unified. So I say, Paddle on, hope givers. Be like Abraham in Romans 4.18, who against hope believed in hope. That he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Be encouraged like Paul who said in Romans 15.13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that he may abound in hope through the power of be like Peter in verse 315, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with weakness and fear. So let us stand as one and believe in the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Let us build bridges together. Look him in the eye. 
Christian or not, and say, do the unthinkable. Get walked on. Don't be arched. Do the unthinkable. Millennials, we need you. Lead the way. Show us how to be one. Be a bridge.